Kawai Saran, welcome to Out and About magazine. It is such a pleasure to have you here today. We've been on the hunt for you for a little while, and I'll share that story at the end of the interview. Okay. But um, could you start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your entrepreneurial journey? First of all, thank you, Marcia, for having me. Um, I'm really curious to learn about your hunting me down story. Uh, the entrepreneurial journey of mine started when I was about 16 years old. I started working for my dad when I was 13. And I say all the time, he's taught me everything I know about um, being an entrepreneur and being a businessman. Whether he knew he was teaching me or not, just being around him and seeing how he did things. And I went to most of the countries anybody would ever want to go to, not for anything other than uh, work, but uh, been around the world a few times, 70 plus countries from a very young age. And that really helped me learn several, several elements of life on different uh, or from different perspectives. So I think that was my, because I think about it all the time, you know, I compare myself to, you know, friends, colleagues, and realize that in some areas I am a lot better than they are, and in some areas they are a lot better than I am. And it's because I didn't have much of a childhood or much of a uh, playful youth, you know, it was all work from a very young age. I was never a major social person either. You know, I was kind of uh, selectively social if it was important for whatever was the task at hand, but I wouldn't be the one to you know, throw parties or attend parties just because I was looking for fun and entertainment. So yeah, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey. Now, can I just pick up on something you said there um, and just on your childhood and that you didn't have much of a childhood. Do you think that's impacted you in any way as an adult? Definitely. Um, I was in the car yesterday, actually, with a good friend of mine and we were driving from Abu Dhabi to Dubai and he goes, are you going to play any music? I said, I don't even know how to turn on the radio. You know, I've, I've never, I've never even had music be a part of my life growing up. You know, I've never had the things that people look at as norms. You know, be, be a part of my, because it wasn't a part of my dad's life. My dad was all you know work oriented and uh, mission focused, and so that definitely shaped me to be the person I am today. Because I mean, again, you are. You are your habits. Whatever you do as a habit eventually shapes who you are as a person. So, um, absolutely, to answer your question, it does. Now, do you think you've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, or is that something that because you saw your dad doing it, that's something that you wanted to do because you wanted to kind of emulate your dad's actions? So, uh, yes, I, I did know that I always wanted to be the age in my mind was 24, you know, when I was in my teens, early teens, I said, I would love to be one of the most successful 24 year olds in the world. Um, so I had this goal that I was working towards without really knowing that I was working towards it, but I would think about it every morning, every morning for the last, or, you know, for that 10 year period from 13, 14 to, to 24. And then my dad obviously is my role model. You know, I still talk to him several times a day about everything. Not work as much, but about everything else going on in my life. Uh, and he's always been the, the perfect scenario or the perfect story for me. You know, I wanted my story to be somewhat the same um, in whatever way possible. So, absolutely, you know, my dad was the role model that I strive to be like. and. Uh, uh, he seems to be pretty proud of what he produced, so, yeah. And you're pretty proud of you as well? Uh, in some areas. Okay. I mean, I think I've excelled pretty pretty good in some areas. In some areas, again, now that I'm a full-grown adult, independent, I'm noticing that I'm lacking in certain areas. Um, 
you know, and lacking severely. But I'm not upset about it either. You know, like I, again, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I don't party, nor do I want to. Okay. Especially now, you know, like growing up, early 20s, I would feel somewhat left out um, because that's what all the cool people my age were doing. And then you realize very quickly that, especially as you get older and life becomes more serious, you realize it's cool being different. Yeah, yeah. it sure is. So let's talk about success a little bit then. Um, what does that look like, feel like, sound like to you? Uh, I think the average person would jump to the conclusion that success is monetary success. And that's a piece of it, but it's not success as a whole. And uh, I've, I've seen you know, a lot of money in my bank account several times throughout my, my, my life. And, you know, at the, at the highest point, I can't say I felt the most successful. Um, so again, money is an important piece of success, obviously, but having balance and peace is also a very important piece of success. I was talking to a good friend of mine the other day and we were going over the fact that you know I reached a part in my life at one point where I was successful from the outside in but from the inside out I wasn't taking care of my mental health physical health um, I didn't really have a home you know I was in between homes you know renting hotel rooms instead of renting a real home or buying a real home and it, it became uh, a real almost trauma with myself and again from the outside everybody's looking at me as this super successful guy who you know all these companies and all this other stuff and I reached a point where I literally didn't care about any of that you know it, it, it almost became uh, irrelevant uh, until I was able to build that balance. And I think the balance consists of family, uh, health, physical and mental, uh, of course, economic balance, social balance. That's what success is. It's not one of those and not the other or others. Now, I just want to pick on the mental health bit because especially with men, we don't talk about that mm -hmm. enough. Um, and we see a lot of what's happening in the media now with quote-unquote successful men who um, could be a little bit more balanced in terms of their mental health. Now, what kind of things do you do to look after your mental health? I'm not the person to come to for mental health advice um, simply because I don't think I've excelled in that area as much as I have in other areas. But I would say this, a friend of mine two and a half years ago, I was really affected by how many employees of ours were affected by COVID. Personally, it didn't change too much of my lifestyle, other than the fact that I wasn't going to offices and doing some of those things, but some of the employees, you know, the businesses that they worked for couldn't afford to pay them their full salaries or couldn't afford to even have them uh, be a part of the same team they were part of because everything was being downsized and that really affected me. It was probably one of the first times in my life that I felt helpless. You know, I didn't know what to do. I couldn't figure it out. You know, I'd speak to all these different mentors that I would have throughout various phases of my life and then I realized that I was stressing it a little bit too much. And I was speaking to another good friend of mine who's, who's a celebrity in, in, in the US and uh, he gave me some solid advice. He said, have you ever considered therapy? I said, well, I'm not crazy, I'm not suicidal, I'm not. And he goes, well, that's the problem. We only associate therapy with, you know, extreme cases of depression or, you know, suicidal thoughts or, you know, drug-related concerns, and it, it doesn't have to be that. You know, you just need someone sometimes to talk to. 
that will not judge, will not um, kind of prolong or just get bored or you not have to feel like you're telling someone something that one day they may use it against you. So I would say therapy is a really important part to not only males, but alpha males mental health. Because again, if you're an alpha in whatever way, you know, you could be the lead trainer at a gym, you could be, you know, the lead chef in a kitchen, you could be, uh, and even if you're not in a leading position, you just have a personality of a leader and you think you're a leader, then you feel like you can't ask for help or you can't ask for someone to kind of be there for you in places that you don't have the answers um, in particularly. So once you find your therapist and your therapist can be a trained therapist or it can be a friend that you noticed therapy or therapist traits in, uh, even if they don't carry that title, just someone that you can talk to is really, really important that you find. Um, and it's not everybody, you know, it's, it's really not everybody. And if you don't have that friend, then find a professional therapist. Oh, thank you. That's solid advice. Um, and I always ask this because I know there are not only men, there are women out there who mm -hmm. struggle with even thinking about sharing some of their issues. So I always ask this to find out what different people think. And if it's something that you don't think about, you know, maybe it's something you're struggling with yourself mm -hmm. um, and it will give you that nudge. But let's go back on to entrepreneurial success uh, and you have clearly had that at a young age. So what advice would you give to a young person wanting to start out in business? Well, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Don't do anything you don't enjoy and don't do anything because you're desperate. It's okay to do that for a little while, just to get out of whatever tight situation you're in financially, but that's not, you, you will never be successful doing something you don't like to do or want to do. So understanding that is the first piece of it because otherwise you just waste your life being miserable, living paycheck to paycheck if even, and you realize 10 years later that you wasted your life so find something you're passionate about whatever that is and and pursue it it could be you could be a barber if you're great at cutting hair then go become a millionaire cutting hair and then open a bunch of barber salons cutting hair and train people to train other people for you to cut hair you know if you're a mechanic see how you excel at whatever part of mechanics you're good at. If it's you're an engine mechanic, okay, can you fix hybrid engines? Can you fix electric engines, which is the new big thing? Can you, what, what else can you do to excel in your passion? That's where success is. I mean, every passion, every industry has the capacity to make you the most successful person you know and you just have to find it. I'm going to take that not lightheartedly because I'm at that space in my career as well mm -hmm. where I'm, I'm deciding you know mm -hmm. that I'm leaving one career for another one because I'm way more passionate mm -hmm. about what I do for example now sitting down and talking to you. Mm -hmm. um, now you, you mentioned your dad as being your motivation and inspiration is there anybody else that you look to for motivation or inspiration? I look at just people that have achieved great things in life coming from humble beginnings. And, you know, there's several of them. I'm not going to name any because I'll leave some of them out. But, you know, I'm sitting in Dubai now and looking at what the ruler of Dubai has built from literally nothing, you know. So he's definitely one of my inspirations but again there's there's a really long list of people that inspire me I don't know all of them I know some of them but again that's a pretty long list to name so let's leave it at that 
Okay, so just external inspiration could be from just a random person you see on the yeah, street. Who... Yeah, I mean, and again, because I know that building a success story is not easy, even if you do have the passion and the talent and the luck and everything else, you still have to balance a lot of things. And that's things at your household, things that, um, you know, your, your, again, mental health being things. That, so you look at the surface of things and assume that it was easy or it was done quickly and, and it's not. So that's why, you know, when you take a city like Dubai or you take a, a major company like uh, Emar, for example, and, and look at what was built, that's inspiration. That's, that's motivation. And do you have a success story of yours that you think has been one of your highlights? I have a few of those, um, for sure. And once I realized and dwelled on one of the first ones, I was, uh, was able to really continue being successful. And what that means is you, you realize things get really hard at times and you think they're gonna fail and they're gonna break and they're gonna explode and you're gonna be embarrassed and you're gonna be... Once you overcome that fear and realize that whatever's on the other side is, is phenomenally greater than whatever you've went through or you're going through. That's, that's when you develop this pattern of success that anybody would want. You know, a, a good friend of mine told me something extremely inspirational and I think about it all the time. He said, to have a convenient life, you have to go through a lot of inconvenience. Steve Harvey. Yes, because I was going to be say... That sounds like Steve, yes. right? So that's, that's <laughs> what Steve told me three days ago. And it's things you think about quite a bit, but don't really implement it, you know? And, and I say you think about it because you would be going through hardship, whether it's at work or, you know, with your, your, your physical health or whatever it is that you're putting in all this effort and work to get to the other side of something great, but you don't really think about what that means. You know, like anyone who has great success went through some really horrible days, went through some really tough moments of just feeling like life was tumbling, you know, everything was collapsing, everything was, and those are the ones that make it to the highest levels of quote-unquote success. Now on Steve Harvey, we um, seen that you've done quite a few things in the region with mm. Steve Harvey, with different celebrities. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about, I read about Melt um, and I've seen like the golf tournament you did, the gala dinner and so on. Just what are you trying to do in that space between, you know, merging East and West? Steve is obviously uh, you know, a very inspirational person. Well, he's one of my you know, inspirational people that I didn't name earlier. Entrepreneur, businessman, the epitome of a success story that so happens to be a celebrity because I know him pretty well and I don't look at him as a celebrity before any of those other things. I know people that are celebrities or that are famous for being a great singer, for example, or a great athlete, mm -hmm. and that's it, you know? And you're like, or you're famous for just being social media famous for whatever reason, you know? But Steve is a, is a different guy in, in that regard. And uh, I mean, he's twice my age, right? He's literally, you know, old enough to be my dad. And he gives me fatherly advice very often. Um, but then he also tells me several times, he's like, look, you're the perfect balance I need because with you, you know, you're, you're, you're built 
in this very kind of serious business form. You're not, you know, in the entertainment world. You're not um, a celebrity by any standards. You're not, and and I think when we saw each other's value, that's when we knew we needed to be partners, and we formed Melt Middle East, which is doing only great things. And what I mean by that, it's it's bridging cultural gaps, but that's that's a phrase that's very, um, I would say, overused. You hear a lot of people saying it, whether they're really doing it or not. But this one is actually involved in student exchange programs and philanthropic programs that are just phenomenal. Um, you know, I'll tell you a quick story about one of the businesses we're bringing uh, to, to the UAE now. I used to get really bad migraine headaches and they would put me out of order for two weeks, you know, two weeks of almost every month I would be in a dark room. So that's half of my life, you know, and uh, Steve one time flew to Abu Dhabi to meet me and he's in town and uh, I mean, I stayed in Abu Dhabi during the time he was there as well, you know, away from my home in Dubai to, to be with him and just to be closer in terms of, and I was, again, in my hotel room for four days. And he's like, dude, where are you? I flew 19 hours to come and see you and you're, you know. And I said, dude, it's, it's really hard to imagine. It's really hard to fathom, but I get bad migraines that put me out of order. It doesn't matter what's on the other side of the room. I can't leave it because if I do, I'll start throwing up. I'll start, you know, having literally seizures. Like it's, it's really bad. So he goes, well, there's this doctor in Houston that you should go see. African-American guy named Kevin Smith. And he tracks him down. I track him down first, couldn't get a hold of him. So Steve tracks him down through his radio team and connects me to this doctor. I go and see him. He does a very simple procedure in my nose that involves a deviated septum that apparently most people have and something else. And I no longer get migraines. I'm four months into not ever having enough migraine. And I also know that I'll never have another migraine because my mental belief is so strong. And that's also important. But the fact is, me and Steve are on the phone going over how amazing it is that this worked for me. And at the same time, we both say, this needs to be in the Middle East and Africa. So that's one of the first physical businesses in partnership with Dr. Kevin Smith that is being set up in, in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, to, this is the only doctor in the world that's figured out how to cure migraines, not treat migraines, but cure migraines. And we believe that should be shared with, with the rest of the world. You know, not everybody can get to the U.S. Not everybody can afford to stay in the U.S. for two or three weeks after the procedure to recover. So businesses like that were attracting to the region. Um, as well as, you know, I talked about some of the other things relating to students and orphans even, you know, so we're, we're doing quite a few um, life-changing projects uh, through MELT. MELT has also um, engaged with governments in the region, including the government of Abu Dhabi, to do some pretty cool entertainment stuff. You know, we just did a big event with Kevin Hart in Abu Dhabi. We did the golf tournament you talked about um, and several other uh, initiatives in the entertainment and tourism spaces. Okay, uh, sounds like a lot. So that's just with um, Melt. Can you just tell us a little bit more of what you're trying to do next? Um, so outside of Melt, what else are you trying to do? And we're going to wrap up once we've done that okay so melt is 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 something i've never done before nor did i ever think was doable uh, for me personally but again i thought about it a little bit more and said no it's all kind of the same thing being 
it's all the same equation. You need a product that you can sell and a customer that looks at that product as something attractive enough that they would spend money on and, and uh, see value in it. It just so happens to be mostly in the entertainment space. My core business is automotive related. It's not a pretty business. It's not, um, you know, something that's very fancy, but we've done it pretty well. And it's because again, it was a passion that I simply wanted to be one of the best at. And today, OWS Automotive is spoken in the same breath as, you know, the, the major manufacturers, whether that's Toyota or BMW or, you know, so, so we've, we've, especially in the region, the Middle East region, we've excelled in a way that was uh, pretty, pretty noticeable, even on the highest levels of the manufacturers. We're one of the strongest automotive players in the Middle East. We have in total about 2,400 employees. So it's, it's not a small business. It's, and it's only growing, the company's growing. So there is a lot for us to look forward to. So there is always the very serious businessman and then mm -hmm. always now in the entertainment space. Thank you so much for talking to us today. Um, we've gotten to learn a lot more about you. Um, I know lots of people see you, but we don't see a lot of you. So this mm -hmm. was a great opportunity to learn a bit more about you. Thank Bef you, Marcia. Um, before we wrap up, just tell me if there's one quote that you live by, what it is and why. The quote I live by is, don't give up. It's, you know, some people might look at that as cliche, but I look at it with its meaning and it's the reason I'm here. You know, I've seen some really dark times and uh, if, if you do give up, that's one of your, I'll actually close this with another Steve Harvey quote. You know, he says, if you're going through hell, you don't want to stop there, right? You, you want to get through it. And that's what I've learned a long, long time ago. Um, you don't give up. Just push through it and look back at it with stories to tell. Thank you so much. Now, there's no better note to end on than that one. Thank, Thank you. you. And keep doing what you do. Keep being Thank successful. We love it. We're here Thank for you. it. I appreciate it. All Thank right. you.